Good evening. Welcome to Rosa Mystica, a journey of renewal and restoration. This is a five-part lecture series over the next 15 months, sponsored by the Illinois Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums. My name is Anne Shea, and I have the honor of serving as president of the Illinois Patrons. Although our headquarters are in Chicago, tonight we are an international community. We have participants from Italy, Australia, and throughout the US, including Hawaii, all interested in the Marian artistic tradition and how it could be brought forward to support our response uh, to faith and our contemporary challenges. Before we move into tonight's program, there are some guidelines for virtual attendance. If we were face to face, I'd say, please turn off your cell phones. But this is our new world, so better said, please view it. We're all learning to walk along this new way. On your screen, there will be opportunities to type questions and answers, or, or questions, I should say, in our Q&A session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. In a talk, Pope Francis sketched the features of a vision for the Vatican Museums. He said, the Vatican Museums are a home for all, and their doors are always open to everyone. They are a testimony to the artistic and spiritual aspirations of humanity and the search for that supreme beauty that finds fulfillment in God. The Patrons of the Arts in the Vatican Museums is an international organization dedicated to raising funds for the preservation, care, exhibition, and restoration of the artistic treasures of the 12 museums that comprise the Vatican Museums. To get a sense of what we do, let us look at a three minute video. As you watch the video, you will see a tapestry being restored. It is one of the 34 artistic pieces the Illinois chapter has restored. This tapestry was restored in honor of Cardinal Supage. Each of these live programs will be broadcasted and placed on our website. A 
Of course, Rosa Mystica is Latin for mystical rose, one of the many titles of Mary. Therefore, each program will showcase magnificent Marian art uh, accompanied by artistic and spiritual commentary. And this is the distinctive approach of the Illinois chapter. We hold together art and the faith tradition of which it is an expression. We're more than art historians and admirers. We bring together art and faith. Why Rosa Mystica now? During these difficult times, we have talked about how to use artistic and spiritual resources for our contemporary challenges. So we're on this journey over the next five programs to look at stunning art and see what type of support and resource art can be for all of us. Tonight, Father Lou Camelli will host our program. Father Camelli is a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago and the Archbishop's Delegate for Formation and Mission. He serves on the board of the Illinois Patrons and is a frequent speaker providing theological perspectives at patrons programs. Father Camelli has published numerous books on faith formation and spirituality. And thank you very much for that introduction. And I want to echo Anne's words of welcome. Welcome to the beginning of this wonderful series. Welcome to, to Chicago's Holy Name Cathedral. Now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Cardinal Blaise Supich. Cardinal Supich is the chairman of the board of directors of the Illinois Patrons of the Arts at the Vatican Museum. And Cardinal Supich will offer us a context, helpful context, as we continue our reflections this evening on faith, art, and images of Mary. Cardinal Supich. Thank you very much, Father Camelli. It's good to be with all of you in this medium of, uh, of the, of the uh, virtual uh, reality that we're all going through at this time. My first thoughts as I always come together with the uh, patrons of the arts uh, for the Vatican Museum is one of gratitude. I'm so grateful for everything that you do. And what you do is not something just to contribute to the faith life of the church, but for the good of all society. Pope, uh, Saint Pope uh, pa Paul VI, uh, once said something that was, I think, very apt for this moment. He says, the split between the gospel and the culture is without a doubt the drum of our time. What he was saying is that so often in life, our culture and the gospel being separated needs a way in which they're bound together again. And the patrons help in that wonderful enterprise of making sure that we bridge that gap. The Rosa, Rosa Mystica Initiative um, helps us link the faith, culture, spirituality um, with the current historical moment in our lives that we're experiencing. The very famous uh, scripture scholar of the last century, Raymond Brown, had this to say about the abil ability, the symbolic ability of Our Lady to uh, offer us a I, I, opportunity to reflect on our discipleship. It is precisely because we do not know much about the historical character and individuality of Mary that she lends herself more freely than Jesus does to a symbolic trajectory. And so far from weakening the person of Mary in the Christian tradition, this perspective as a symbolic figure enables us to have different artistic representations of Our Lady in various cultures and historical contexts, but always with a singular and consistent portrayal of her reality as a mother and a disciple of her son. In reality then, Mary offers us a template for being a disciple, for being one who is related to our Lord and encountering him. This is the internal dynamic of the great diversity of Marian art that captures her symbolic trajectory and her capacity to inspire the great diversity of believers across various cultures and historical moments. Again, citing St. 
Paul, Pope Paul VI confirming all of this, the Virgin Mary has always been proposed to the faithful by the church as an example to be imitated, and not precisely in the type of life she led, and much less for the social cultural background in which she lived and which today scarcely exists anymore. Rather, she is held up as an example to the faithful for the way in which her own particular life, she fully, she fully and responsibly accepted the will of God because she heard the word of God and she acted on it. And because charity and a spirit of service were the driving force of all of her actions. She is worthy of imitation, the late Pope said, because she was the first and the most perfect of Christ's disciples. So given this understanding of the Virgin Mary and the consequent richness of artistic representations associated with her, I'm really delighted that the patrons of the Vatican Museum are reclaiming and reappreciating her, the Rosa Mystica, in great works of art found here in Chicago and also in the Vatican Museum. Additionally, observing across the months the process of restoration and renewal of, of a particular art, the Annunciation, underscores the important mission of the patrons to know, to learn, to preserve, to share the rich legacy of, her, of our artistic heritage that is wonderfully available to us through the Vatican Museum. And a particular note is that this painting of the Annunciation uh, seems to be linked and maybe even attributed to Domenico, Domenico Ghirondaio and his brother Davide. What's important is that Domenico was, uh, his student was Michelangelo. So the patrons in investing in this restoration are really offering us an opportunity not only to reflect on Our Lady, but to be in contact with a very historical moment. I'm told also that x-rays have been taken of this uh, with infrared tests as well. And it has been determined that there is an underdrawing, a charcoal drawing underneath the painting. That's great news for us and we look forward to learning more about that. Again, I'm so grateful to be a part of this evening, but also to help launch this wonderful moment of looking at Our Lady and appreciating uh, the art that is before us as an opportunity to bridge the gospel and our culture. Cardinal Supic, thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful launch, as you said to this very promising program that will extend across the next 15 months. And now in this part of this evening's program, Rebecca Long and I are going to offer some reflections on particular images of Mary. Uh, Rebecca Long is the Patrick G. and Shirley W. Ryan Associate Curator of European painting and sculpture at the Art Institute of Chicago. And very recently, she was a curator for an extraordinary exhibit on El Greco uh, entitled Ambition and Defiance. And if you had the pleasure to tour that exhibit and listen to the guide, you'll recognize Rebecca's voice. And not only her voice, but also her very incisive a commentary uh, on El Greco. So uh, Rebecca and I are first going to consider uh, icons and I'll speak more directly to two icons uh, in the Eastern tradition, more specifically Russian icons. And we, we do this uh, because um, the Russian tradition, the Eastern tradition in general, offers us a foundation historically for those representations that we in the West are more familiar with in the Renaissance and, and afterwards. So there's a foundation here uh, that, that is important artistically. Also, uh, the icons provide us with a very direct link between 
image and faith. Now, after that, we're going to consider a painting of Fra Angelico uh, taken from the Vatican Museum. And it's a picture of Mary and the infant Jesus accompanied by angels as they often are, but also St. Dominic and St. Catherine of Alexandria. And that will lead us into another perspective, another take on the whole trajectory of Marian art and the way it unfolds an experience of faith. So with that, I, I, I'd like uh, Rebecca to offer us a bit of context on the icons, the iconic tradition. And um, interestingly enough, that exhibit that she curated on El Greco is linked to this because as perhaps many of you may know already, El Greco began as an iconographer. So Rebecca, would you please uh, offer us some reflections on icons? If everyone is able to see my PowerPoint now, um, what I wanted to show you is actually the living history of these Byzantine Eastern Orthodox icons um, as we can see them in Chicago today. I mean, I, I'm a, I am not a, a Chicago native, but I have been told by many, many people uh, that there is a very proud and extraordinarily large Greek population here in Chicago. And what I'm showing you right now is the iconostasis screen from the Church of the Holy Trinity in the, in the city of Chicago. And so what you're looking at are icon paintings that are embedded in an architectural format. Um, and what you're seeing are that the central lower portion, the doors are closed, right? You can see that. You can't see through what is happening in the central space beyond this iconostasis. And then in the second image, which is also from Chicago, St. Joseph the Betrothed, which is a Ukrainian Greek church, you see also an iconostasis screen, but here with the doors opened, and you can see the altar inside. So the paintings outside on the iconostasis, and then inside where, shall we say, the work is done by the priest. And this is really what the evolution of the icon is in the Greek Orthodox Church of the Byzantine Orthodox Church going back in, into the period of, of, as Father Lou said, El Greco, um, where there's a separation between the practice of the mass, which is done by the priests, and then there is a laity outside of the screen who experiences the rituals at a distance. And um, this is often in terms of my background is art history. So I will be interested to hear if, uh, if Father or the Cardinal have any um, alternative views of this. But the idea is that the laity is educated by the representation of these holy scenes on the outside of the screen because they're not expected to be able to be literate enough to read the Bible by themselves or that they need to have Bible be interpreted by someone who is more informed. And so in the Greek church, at least, this iconostasis tradition continues today. Whereas as the Catholic Church, the Western Church, there's been a, 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 an evolution in the way that we consider the interior of the church, the meaning of paintings and art within the church in terms of um, interpretation, education, that is always there. However, the efficacy and the sort of um, voluntary 
sort of uh, interpretation by the people who are attending the mass is very different than what we see in the Eastern Orthodox Church that continues this tradition of the echinostasis. And so to follow up on what the uh, painting is that is most relevant to what Father mentioned earlier in the exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago about El Greco, Domenicos Theodokopoulos, to just remind you in our very, very, very Greek city of how Greek he is. Um, this is an artist who was born in 1541 on the island of Crete, which is then and is now um, part of, of, of the Greek um, empire, the Greek uh, political community. He was born and raised as an icon painter. And I think it's fascinating um, for any of us who are really art lovers um, to look at a painting like this and to think of it as being by El Greco. El Greco, the El Greco we know. But he was really raised and trained as an icon painter. He went through the whole very formal traditional process of, of training and being certified on the island of Crete. He grew up in what is now the, the city known as Heraklion. And in his mid-20s, he moved to uh, Venice, the Venetian Republic, politically controlled this whole section of the Adriatic Sea that Crete was part of. So that's not entirely surprising that he would move on for, you know, higher expectations of patronage and, and money and wealth and fame. But in the exhibition at the Art Institute, which closes on October 19th, so please hurry and go see it very safe uh, personal distancing protocols in place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have one icon. There are only four that survive um, that are believed to be by El Greco from his early Byzantine icon painting phase. And this one in particular is interesting because it shows St. Luke painting a painting of the Virgin Mary and the Christ child, and you see them on an easel, and you see his tools underneath the easel, and you see a little, a little workbench supporting the tools. And on that workbench is a signature of El Greco, Domenicos Teotokopoulos. And that's how we know that this is by this artist, otherwise um, known for a very different style. Um, but he's painting a, a version of a, of a painting of, of the Virgin and Child that is divinely inspired. And this is what the icon is by definition. It's a painting that shows a holy figure or figures, but is informed by a divine source. So in this case, I think maybe, I hope you can see my arrow pointing on the screen. You see the figure of an angel. This painting is very damaged and worn, but you see the figure of an angel who is coming down from heaven to tell St. Luke what the Virgin Mary looked like. And so he can paint this image based on divine information. And um, this particular image of the Virgin and Child, believed by, by the faithful um, to be painted by St. Luke, can still be seen in a chapel in Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, for example. So this is what the icon tradition is. It is a type of painting that is divinely inspired, and it is a, as, a, as an inspiration for prayer, it is meant as a sort of intermediary between the human world and the divine. So the image itself is not necessarily holy, but the way that we interact with it gives us a direct line to the holy. 
Rebecca, thank you very much. That's, that's very, very helpful. And uh, let me just offer a, a word. Uh, you, you had mentioned the iconostasis and as an instructional uh, experience so that the faithful can understand the mysteries. Uh, in addition to that, as you just now noted, the icons actually, uh, in the Eastern tradition, place people in the divine presence, in the presence of the saints, and, and, and so forth. So there's an instructional piece, yes, but there's also a way in which, uh, by being surrounded by these images and figures, people are swept into what is called the divine liturgy. In other words, it's a, a foretaste of, of heaven and uh, very powerful so that the icons uh, from a spiritual theological perspective have a kind of sacramental value. They are effective signs of the presence of, 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 of the Lord, of his saints, of his angels. Now, would you be able to uh, put up on the screen the, uh, the two Russian icons? No, there we go. Okay, and because I want to offer some reflections on, on these uh, two icons, which have meant so much to me, uh, because, well, we can look at them from a, a number of perspectives, uh, as Rebecca did so well to look at things artistically, but I want to look at this in terms of the theological and spiritual uh, value. These are both images of Mary, and both of them represent something of an extraordinary trajectory. Let's just go to the, the image on the left is the, uh, a traditional uh, image of the Theotokos, Mary the, the God-bearer, its mother and child. Uh, Mary is holding her son, the incarnate word, and, and the mystery of the incarnation is captured in this particular icon. Now, the other one on the other side is known as the comesis or the dormition of Mary, her falling asleep. In the Western tradition, we would call this the, uh, the assumption of Mary. And if you take a look carefully, you'll see that in the first painting, the mother is holding the child, incarnation. No, we gotta go, that's it. And then in the, the other painting, the, the, the Dormition, the Comesis, or the Assumption of Mary, the child, the risen, glorified Lord, who is the conqueror of death, is holding in symbolic way that, that little figure in, wrapped in white, that's his mother. So the mother holding the child, the child holding the mother. And there's a whole trajectory of faith that's represented in these two icons. In the first one, it is the reality of the incarnation, the word made flesh who came among us and became like us in all things but sin. In the second, it is the representation of, in a very specific way, of the redemption, the conquering of death, the embrace of the fullness of life. And so, uh, the Second Vatican Council says of Mary that assumed into heaven, as we see in this second um, uh, icon, uh, she is a sure sign of hope and comfort for the pilgrim people of God on their journey. Now, if I, I, we could go on in greater detail and, and spend more time reflecting on these uh, two icons, but my, my point is this, that we're here looking at very particular images of Mary. And what they do is they reveal a way of concretizing faith beyond propositions, beyond statements of belief, to a direct experience of incarnation and redemption. And, you know, here's, let me just leave this part of the conversation with this thought, it's so concrete. It's mother and child together. The theologian Karl Rahner once said that as long as we 
have Mary. Jesus will never be an abstraction because, as he said in a kind of mischievous way, abstractions don't have mothers. So from another angle, Pope St. John Paul II spoke of the rosary, but it could be applied to icons as well. The rosary and icons are looking at Jesus through the eyes of Mary. So in other words, a mother's eyes, the eyes of attention, the eyes of love, the eyes of really being present are, are there. So uh, these images are extraordinarily powerful in the way in which they, they capture in, in a very real way faith. Now, we're gonna move on. And at this point, we're gonna move on to the Fra Angelico painting uh, that is a part of the collection in the Vatican. And uh, Rebecca, perhaps you can uh, speak a bit, give us a bit of context and maybe identify some of the notable characteristics of, of that, this painting so that we can have a, a deeper appreciation of this, this beautiful work. I will, and I will also say that um, I, as, as the Cardinal said earlier, we are living in differently historic times and there are um, ambulance sirens in the background. So. Oh. <laughs> Please forgive me for the realness of, of this presentation. Um, but I think uh, it also is fairly comparable to the realness of, of life and the way that these images had life. Um, so we're moving from Byzantine icons to Fra Angelico, painting on a scale that is very similar. So if you as long as everyone can see my screen, please let me know if you can't. Um, this is a, a nine by seven inch painting that is in the collection of the Vatican Museums, exquisitely painted by this marvelous painter that we know as Fra Angelico. His birth name was Guido di Pietro. He lived Sometime around the year 1395, we're not exactly sure when he was born, and he died in 1455. And he, to us today, anyone who's been to Florence in particular, knows uh, Fra Angelico because he, he gained his fame as a painter to the Dominican order. So he joined the community of the Dominicans at, at the um, Monastery San Marco in Florence, which when you go to Florence today is right outside of the square that is the main bus kind of depot for Florence. But this is all to say that it was then and is now a very living part of Florence. So it's not the example of an artist who joined monastic community and went up into the mountains and never talked to anyone in real life ever again. He was, was then and is now part of the central life and, and cultural community of Florence. And I think part of that is why he's so fascinating for us as an artist. And when you go to Florence as, as a tourist, if we're ever able to travel again, hopefully that's, this is at the top of your list, but San Marco, the, the monastic community that he joined in Florence is just about, I think, the most perfect encapsulation of really what it must have been like to be a monk in a monastery that was enclosed from the outer world in, in the 15th century in the central part of Italy. So for me, Fra, Fra Angelico is both a master painter and an exemplar of, of what his lifestyle type really was in Florence at the time. And so what we're looking at right now on the screen is an example of his artwork that is um, on view, hopefully, hopefully on view today, 
not that any of us can go there again. When the next time you go to Rome, um, on view at the Vatican museums and um, at a certain level, it's a very basic image of Madonna and child surrounded by angels and saints with a kind of decorative background behind her. But when we pick it apart, we sort of start to see the trends and future movements of the Italian Renaissance as we know it in this artwork. Um, so, so just to say, sorry, before I move on one moment, that we're looking at a painting circa 1435. This artist called Guido da Pietro, who we know as Fra Angelico because of his, um, his second life, first life, second life, Debatable. If you talk to an art historian, his first life. If you talk to a theologian, probably his first life as a, a, a valuable member of the man, monastic community at San Marco in Florence. Um, Madonna and Child between uh, Saints Dominic and Catherine of Alexandria, and also the choir of angels in the background. And I also really want to point out before we move along the size of this image, which is very small. It's nine by seven inches, um, roughly. Tempera on wood panel, which is roughly what we would assume the normal um, style and medium of painting would be for the day. So who is Fra Angelico? This is a man um, who obviously joined a monastic order. Um, San Marco in Florence doesn't give you much of a hint, but it's actually a Dominican order, still active today. Um, and if I were to recommend places to visit as a tourist in Florence, I would put San Marco at the top of the list. It really, really will blow your mind in terms of considering how art made in this moment was made for a particular purpose and how the beauty of the artwork could really make the spiritual life of the people who live there rise above the daily, I don't want to say humdrum, but you could hire anyone to paint a scene like this, an Annunciation on the cell that you live in. But you could also hire Fra Angelico. And if you hired Fra Angelico, you got something more than just the average guy. And so what we're looking at right now is a fresco um, by Fra Angelico. Once he was admitted into the Dominican order in San Marco and um, was charged with painting, I'll show you in a moment, a series of artworks for the living spaces of the monks that live there. And these are, when you look in today, this is a remarkable place to visit in Florence. I highly recommend you go there. I mean, it really gives you a sense of how the monks lived in the period. These rooms are five feet by seven feet, five feet by 10 feet, something like that. If you're lucky, you have a window. And if you're really lucky, you have a wall with a fresco by Fra Angelico. And so the, the scene that I'm showing you now, which shows the Annunciation um, where the Archangel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary and explains what's going to happen to her. Um, when you walk up the steps into where the level of, we'll call it apartments for, you know, better um, explanation, where the, the cells of all the monks are, where they live, where they sleep. So you walk up the stairs from the level of the church, the cloister, the public, public spaces, into the private spaces. At the very top of the stairs, you see this fresco of the Annunciation. 
and the architecture, the style of the way that the perspective is presented. This is Florence in 1450. This is what life looks like in Florence in 1450. And so this is really the ideal artist for the time and for the place. And then beyond that, so the, I, I will beg forgiveness to those who know more about monastic life in the 15th century than I do. But my understanding is that every monk has his own cell and this is where you live and sleep. And in each individual cell that you visit today, which is now a museum in San Marco in Florence, you see a fresco by Fra Angelico. So these are two examples of what you see when you look as a visitor today, you kind of look through bars at the door. Um, but on the left of the screen, you see a beautiful fresco um, depiction of, of the Annunciation to Mary. And on the right, a much more complicated iconographically um, example of the resurrection of Christ and the various iconographies that go around with it. But this is to say that Frangelico was not just an artist, he was a member of this religious community. So he was born in 1395, we think. He died in 1455 in Rome. So he was raised in central Italy, but his artistic talent, while valuable to the order to which he belonged, eventually, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna break beyond those molds. You're gonna move on and someone else is going to recognize you. And in his case, the someone else was the Pope. So he is called to Rome and um, he spent uh, about five or six years in the service of Pope Eugene IV in Rome. Um, so this is an artist who probably grew up thinking that he would never move beyond this very personal day-to-day -day sort of interpretation of his art in Florence and ends up working for the Pope in Rome at the Vatican. And um, so the work that we're looking at uh, here today that's now in the Vatican collections um, we have to assume that it was made for probably some sort of official papal court patronage, if not made for the Pope himself, then one of the cardinals in his retinue. Um, this is at the height of, you know, the wealth and, and, and the reach of the Catholic Church in terms of patronage. And it's also very different from the works that we had seen um, that he made in Florence, where um, you know these these are tiny little cells. So you wake up in the morning, and you're, and you're meant to be living with them every single day, and thinking about them every single day. And while this artwork um, at the Vatican is also very very small, it's only nine by seven inches. We have to imagine it being used in some sort of domestic context. Unfortunately, we don't, there aren't enough records that survive that we know where this came from. Um, but we, we have to think of Piero working on a larger scale, on a scale for a patron like a Pope. So in this case, we have, um, the Virgin Mary and the Christ child, like we, like we saw them in the icons that Father Lou showed us earlier, um, in a very direct and intimate way, engaging with each other. They're shown against a very elaborate tapestry background, which is the way that you would drape a throne in a throne room for a secular ruler. So it's as if 
the Virgin Mary and the, and the baby Christ child here are being shown like they are a king and a queen. Um, that type of elaborate tapestry that you see in the background is exactly what you would expect to see in a royal portrait, for example. And so the things that Fra Angelico does here that are slightly different are showing patron saints in the foreground. So just to flash back, um, I hope you can see my pointer here, but at the lower left hand corner is a figure of St. Dominic and at the lower right hand corner, a figure of St. Catherine of Alexandria. So here's St. Dominic shown in the black and white of the Dominican order founded in um, the beginning of the 13th century. Um, during the lifetime of St. Dominic, the black and white robes would have been immediate, they still are. I mean, if you wander around Rome, you're gonna eventually run into somebody in black and white and they're gonna be a Dominican friar. Um, and the lilies are a symbol of, uh, of, of St. Dominic. And on the other side of the, the Virgin Mary at the bottom of the painting, uh, an image of St. Catherine of Alexandria. Her story is, is familiar to many people who follow the history of the church whereby there's an early person in the history of the church who was converted into Christianity and they face opposition by the official Roman um, regiment and, and state religion, but they hold their own and they're eventually martyred for their devotion to Christianity. And so for St. Catherine, she was tortured. I will not get into the details because it gets pretty messy. But she was tortured on a, a spiked wheel. So you will, you will often be able to recognize her because of, of a portion of a wheel that shows up near her and what she's holding in her arms, which is hard to see a little bit now, just because of the conservation of the painting uh, or the state of conservation of the painting is the palm of a martyr. So anytime a saint is martyred and shown as a martyr in um, Western artistic tradition, they're holding a palm branch and that, and that is what she's holding. So that is St. Catherine as we know her. And so what we really don't know much about this painting in terms of the origin of it, who commissioned it, why did they want it? The small scale of it suggests that like many of the icons that we see coming out of the Eastern Church, it was meant for private devotion. It was meant for a really personal confrontation between um, the viewer of the painting and, and the divine figures in the painting. And what Fra Angelico is doing that is moving forward from those um, original Eastern icon paintings artistically is showing for example, more imagination in terms of what three-dimensional figures look like in space. So again, if you can see on your screen, my, my cursor right now, the Virgin Mary's knees projecting forward underneath her robe so that she has a certain three-dimensionality around her. And also one of the great questions of European Christian art is, what actually is a halo in in terms of physicality in art? Like, what is a halo? Is it a glow? Is it a physical thing? Is it just goldness in the air? Like, what is a halo and how do you show that in art? And in this case, Frangelico, who is coming into this question sort of mid-Renaissance, has a kind of mid-Renaissance solution to this, which is it's a sort of dinner plate. <laughs> and I say that with all respect, but there is a, a physical gold glow behind the head of each figure such that 
if you stand in front of another figure, in these cases, these are all angels, the halo will block the view of the person behind you. And I think we will probably see in future discussions in this lecture series how, how that evolves. But that's a really tricky question throughout the history of art is how do you show these very mystical things with a sense of physical reality. And I think Frangelico, because he was both an artist and a friar, a member of a religious community who lived the truth of this on a day-to-day -day basis, he had a very particular um, take on these things. So um, with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you, Rebecca. That, that's very helpful. It gives us a, a wonderful context I, I just want to offer a couple of brief comments, too, from a, a, a spiritual theological perspective. In beginning around 1220, around the time of the foundation of the Dominicans, but more importantly, maybe of uh, the movement of St. Francis, there was a certain kind of renewal that was taking, began to take place. And it really, you could say it was the humanization of faith, that, that faith, which in many respects had migrated to universities and to speculation and, and, and become somewhat abstract, that there was a retrieval, a recovery. Uh, Rebecca and I uh, offered some reflections, for example, at the Art Institute last uh, Christmas season on the uh, Neapolitan crush, wh which is a wonderful example of that kind of humanization of faith, that, that the Lord is near, it, the Lord is close. And I think what we see in this particular painting of Fra Angelico is an emergent humanized faith. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the infant is playing with the cheek of his mother. She's holding a rose. The, the saints are there, and this becomes eventually that tradition artistically known as Sacra Conversazione, Holy Conversation immersed in a, a community. Um, so uh, this painting, this image of Mary uh, with her child offers us a, a take, a, a particular perspective on faith as something warm and personal, uh, retrieving the uh, foundational relationship with, uh, with Jesus. So um, let me maybe just leave it at that and I, I think, well, one other thing, just let me finish with this, that uh, Fra Angelico is painting in Florence, which of course is the kind of the seat, the beginning of Renaissance humanism, but embedded and connected intimately with that humanism that will assume many different forms and flower in artistic expressions and in scientific work and philosophical speculation, there is also a religious, spiritual humanization of, of faith. So, and, and the place of Mary in all of that is essential. So at this point, we're going to um, take some questions and um, I invite uh, Rebecca and Cardinal Supich. I think that. Uh, yes, uh, thank, first Anne. of all, thank you, Cardinal Supich, Father Camelli, and Rebecca Long. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. Uh, we'll begin our Q&A session for a few minutes. And as I said, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, Cardinal Supich, a question for you. When you hear this presentation and the time you are in Rome, what are your thoughts on the Vatican museums? Well, of course, uh, I've had uh, the pleasure of being uh, at the Vatican Museum a number of times, but even more recently with the restoration of that beautiful tapestry. Uh, the Thank meticulous uh, effort that they go to preserve uh, the art is the backstory, because most of the people who go to the Vatican Museum are uh, seeing the art that's there. But to see these curators, to see the uh, restorers, uh, and the great dedication that they have to uh, preserve this uh, wonderful uh, art for future generations 
uh, is for me is a, a, a kind of ministry for them. Uh, it's the way they devote their whole life. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, I think uh, there are people who will never be known. Artists are known because they're very famous. They sign paintings or whatever. Michelangelo, of course, sculpted his name in the ribbon on the Pieta. Uh, but these people uh, are known only to God, and, um, and that is reward enough for them, it seems. Thank you. Um, Father Camelli, a question for you. Even though we don't know much regarding Mary, are there common aspects in her depiction? Are there common aspects in the artistic representations of Mary? Uh, yes, I, I think that's pretty safe to say. Uh, again, I'm gonna look at it not so much from the art historical perspective as a spiritual one, uh, but let's uh, say, uh, for example, with the various Annunciation scenes, there is that depiction of availability, willingness, readiness, surrender. And that, that, that's pivotal. Those are key themes. But also then when you have the Madonna and child motif, uh, again, another kind of common, but yet absolutely profound spiritual disposition of attentiveness, watching, waiting, holding, these are all pieces of a very rich, deep spiritual tradition, and they get translated then into artistic representation. So I, I think there are others too. I mean, you could move in the direction of the, the Pieta and the Sorrowful Mother. So that whole uh, challenge and confrontation of hope before suffering, that, that's yet another kind of common motif. So those are just a few examples, I think, of uh, steady themes that get played out in the artistic tradition with Mary. Can I add a... Thank you. Uh, uh, Rebecca, uh, a Can question add... for you. What is Fra Angelico most known for in art history? So Fra Angelico to us is most known for the work that he did at San Marco in Florence. And I think it's a really beautiful example of a perfect alignment between the artist who was needed for a community and the artist who was available for a community. So you have Frangelico who has joined the order and you have the hierarchy of whoever was in charge of hiring people at San Marco. And I, this is, if you, when and if we're able to travel again, San Marco is, is the best thing to see in Florence. I mean, you walk up the stairs and you see the frescoes and the cells and you, there's no better example of the way that people lived with art, that religious people lived with art in the period and, and with the best art that was available at the time. And I think that is really, I mean, if anybody ever did the job that they were on earth to do, that would be um, for Angelico. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Um, Cardinal Supic, I have another question for you. What are some of your thoughts on Mary, art and faith? Uh, on, on the what? What are some of your thoughts on Mary, art, and faith? Mary, art, and faith. Um, I think that art uh, allows us to um, really get into an encounter with, with Our Lady. Um, I've always been struck by what I've been told is the difference between icons and art that emerged in the year 1000 where religious figures were part of a landscape rather than just dominating the scene. And in an icon, if you follow the eyes of the icon of the holy image that's there, wherever you are, those eyes follow you. Uh, and so it's a matter of those icons being a subject rather than an object that we look at. And so 
Mary particularly is one. Uh, you asked Father Camelli earlier about what's common in the themes or depictions of Our Lady. One of the things for me is that there is an invitation to encounter of her. And the icon particularly does that because there is this sense in which she's, we're living in her gaze. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's uh, something very important for us as believers to keep in mind is that uh, this, this sense of Mary having a, uh, uh, a part in our own lives today, not just uh, someone of the past, but uh, with this notion of the assumption that she really is present in our lives and, and our helper. Uh, Mary, help of Christians is one of the oldest names of Mary, the titles. And so I think that this, this sense in which Mary, through art, uh, is the one that we are able to encounter. That's great. Thank you. And we have a number of questions. Let's, uh, I have one more question for you, Father Camelli. Are there modern icons of Mary, or is this purely an historical art form? Well, you know, I'm just trying to think. Um, th there are uh, obviously artists uh, who have modern or more recent artists in any case who have done uh, representations of, of Mary. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the French artist Rouault, certainly. Um, and if I'm not mistaken too, even uh, Chagall has his own way of, of representing uh, Mary. There's a, a section of the Vatican Museums uh, that has modern art and there are Marian representations there. So I, you know, one of the things I think that's in play is that um, there's going to be a different sensibility. Uh, people will be drawn by one or another image it's, there, there's something, it's not accidental that we keep getting drawn back to these images, for example, the Fra Angelico image, which is so rich and, and beautiful. So it's not just our, the contemporary representations. Our, in our own American mentality, what's newest is best may not necessarily wash in this uh, situation, that we draw on our history and that history is, embodies a kind of collective memory, uh, a memory not only of ways of imagining, but also of being devoted, of being attached, of encountering, and so forth. So while there are more recent modern representations, I think personally I have a bias towards some of the more traditional ones. Thank you. Can I, Anne, can you hear me? Can I add on to that? So. Thank you. So, well, we'll continue. We'll have the closing remarks. Okay. Uh, so, when we designed Rosa Mystica, we wanted to show you our mission and why we do what we do. We wanted to create an opportunity to virtually bring the beauty and mission of the Vatican Museums. So we discussed how to do this. Through the generosity of the Maza Foundation, we will have the ability to show you. As a Cardinal Supage briefly mentioned the Annunciation painting, um, which is part of the Archdiocese of Chicago. And this will begin on December 8th. The title of that evening is Mary, Hearer of the Word. This painting really captures the biblical scene of Mary and the angel Gabriel, which of course is one of the most popular Christmas scenes. That evening, we will also reflect artistically and spiritually on Francesco Salvati's Immaculate Conception from the 16th century, and that's currently in the Vatican Museums. Jack Shea will provide the spiritual commentary, and Rebecca Long will present the artistic perspective. It will be an illuminating session, both from the point of view of art and faith. We look forward to having you join us. I would like now to introduce Father Jack Wall, who serves as Cardinal Supage's representative on the patrons, and as I always say, my sidekick in leading the Illinois chapter. Father Wall. 
Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Colonel Supich, Father Camelli, and Rebecca. Thank you so much for creating this beautiful evening together. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight in the midst of this pandemic year of such uh, sa sadness, sorrow, and distress. But we have come together in this virtual way to create an experience together, an experience of utter beauty, a beauty in the person of Mary, the mystical rose. This is the first of these sessions, and we hope that you will join us again, that you will invite your friends, and that you will help us to continue these evenings through your generous support and donations. If you are already a member of the Illinois Patrons, we encourage your continuing sponsorship. And if you are with us for the first time, we encourage you tonight to become part of the international movement to help preserve and conserve the art of all ages and cultures that is the long and historic le legacy of the Vatican Museum. Now more than ever in these dark days, we need the gift of art and its special power to lead us to the source of all beauty, to encounter anew the spirit of God revealed in the work of inspired artists and sculptors throughout the ages. And we need you. We need you and we'd like to ask you to join us in this great worldwide enterprise of supporting the work of the Vatican Museum. On your screen, we have listed ways in which you can become a member as an individual or as a family and some of the special opportunities that membership offers you. And we have a promise to make to you. If you join the Illinois patrons, you will not only meet new friends, but some of the most wonderful companions who share our mission to preserve and conserve the beauty of the Vatican Museum collection. And who also, when we can safely travel together, create the very best pilgrimages to Rome that you will ever experience. So please join us virtually on December 8th for our second session of Rosa Mystica. Registration opens on October 15th. And please join us as members of the Illinois Patrons. Visit our website at IllinoisPatrons at gmail.com. And so, good night, buona sera, and God bless. Thank you. <laughs>